FMLA, one of our favorite, favorite programs in HR. And if you've been listening to the show for the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to break it down. And if nothing else, give you some things to think about. Because if you haven't been well-educated on this topic, you really need to seek that out. The, the uh, information that I've been providing is all coming from the HR Academy. And it's, a, it's about a two-hour program, maybe three, depending on the participation of the group when we do it on site with clients. But it, it, it's meant to make it as thorough as possible to kind of get you saturated into all the details. Because, again, when you're, you're dealing with the Department of Labor – and wage an hour, they take this stuff really seriously. I mean, there's no playing games here. When you're talking about somebody's health and needing time to either attend to themselves for a serious health condition or care for a family member, it, this is, you know, this, you need to be sharp on this. So today um, is, I, I believe, show three, and we're going to talk about the questions that you can ask because this is, this is not willy-nilly. And I, I keep reiterating this, and I can't emphasize this enough. Look, if you haven't trained your supervisors on this entire program, and you yourself aren't real comfortable with this, you need to make sure that individuals who are expressing um, interest or have situations that are going to come up that they're saying, look, I need time off. I'm, I'm going to have to be away for a while. I need a change in my schedule. And it's for a medical condition or the medical di- condition of a family member. Those conversations need to come to HR or someone who's been trained in this. And, and we're going to go over some of the questions that you're permitted to ask because you can't, people just can't start rolling out a conversation about a medical condition. Those rules have not changed COVID's gone, EEOC has pulled us all back, and so here we go, because remember, you don't have to ask all these questions, but you're certainly going to want to ask a few of them. So one of the first questions that we can ask if someone expresses um, a concern around needing extended leave is, what is the reason for the absence? It's basic. So you're asking for time off. What do you need it for? You can ask if the absence is because of an injury or illness. And what job tasks are they unable to perform because of it? Now, that question alone is going to open up a number of doors. First thing I always think of is if you're asking about an an injury or illness, if it's an injury, you want to clarify whether it's whether workers' comp's involved in it. If it's an illness or injury that's so bad that they aren't able to perform some of the tasks, what other possible program could we be referring to? You're absolutely right. What we're about to talk about with this employee might also involve the Americans with Disabilities Act if you have 15 or more employees. And if you have, if, uh, if you're talking about FMLA, you have to have at least 50 employees within a certain radius, reporting into a certain radius. So <clears throat> do you see where I'm going? These are vague enough questions, but we're, we're very possibly going to pull a lot of information from these. You're also a- 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 able to ask, is your absence because of an injury or illness that you experienced overnight stay in a healthcare facility? If that's a yes, that elevates it very, very fast. Very, very fast. You can ask, will they be visiting a health care provider? Elevates it very fast. See, when you're talking about FMLA, well, when you talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act, you almost have to have a mental checklist. Because you're not only you're trying to determine is this individual eligible for these kind of programs from uh, a a time period with the company and hours worked, but 
you're also trying to decide, is this a condition where th- this is going to be an option for them? You can ask if their absence is because of, of such a, a condition or an illness that they're under the care of a health care provider now as we speak. Are they, um, are they in the hospital? Are they um, bedridden because the doctor has told them not to come to work? Or they're, um, they've been in a car accident and they're being under observation. So there's no real injury or accident yet. But And again, are you listening to these carefully? Some may be FMLA eligible. Some may not. You can ask if their absence is to care for a family member with an injury or illness. And is that family member under the care of a health care provider? We didn't talk about it in our first show, but individuals who are caring for a spouse or family member that's been injured or is returning with conditions from the military, they get even extra time beyond the 12 weeks. And that's another whole topic which you really need to be aware of. But, you know, just having the answer, just starting that dialogue to figure out if it is for a family member will put you on another whole checklist of questions. And through all this, hopefully they will understand, look, I I need to give them, I need to give my employer as much information as possible because there's one key question we haven't asked in this, and I'm hoping that you'll come to it at the end. But another one that we can ask is how long do you expect to be absent? When can we expect you to return to work? Is your guess of needing two weeks off is that your estimate or is it your healthcare provider? Do you think that you're going to be um, needing additional time afterwards? If you're in the hospital for the next three weeks, will you need time at home to repair? Again, open into questions. You're asking again how serious this is. And you're trying to decide what what paperwork, what program, how can I take care of them? You can also ask, when did you learn of the need for the absence? Now, obviously, if it's a car accident or a stroke, (laughs) that that wasn't predicted. We're not going to worry about that. But if it's someone who's scheduling, um, you know, cancer treatments, or if it's someone who's scheduling heart surgery, you know, we want to kind of get an idea of, of, of how much time we've got in terms of getting the paperwork, how much notice did they know? Maybe to me, if they've known for a while, but never came to anybody, is there a problem on the floor that they don't feel like they can talk to their supervisor or they didn't know enough? We're not as a company communicating the benefit of FMLA and they had no idea that it was important to to share this as early as possible. Look, FMLA is not a topic that we talk about in the the process of doing business. I get that. we, We all understand that outside of HR. However, you need to keep coaching your teams. These questions are not rocket science. But the one thing they didn't ask, and I'm hoping you all figured it out, The one thing we're not diving in and probing for is the diagnosis. We're not going to talk about the specifics. Now, I know you're kind of chuckling here. Most employees are going to already give it to you. They're already going to say, yeah, I've got lung cancer and, you know, I've got to have this treatment. I got to have that treatment. And I just, they're going to want to divulge because they need somebody to talk to. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not HR's responsibility, nor is it our need to know all the details of the diagnosis. We are without a doubt not going to be calling the doctors 
we are not going to be calling the hospitals because then we're going to be, be crossing over HIPAA guidelines. However, if we determined that paperwork is necessary and we need to give this individual an opportunity to have the health provider go further on what exactly is needed in terms of time and accommodations and, and a possible return date, that paperwork is going to go back. It's going to go from the employee to the doctor and then back from the doctor to the employee and then to us. And it's not going to have a diagnosis on it. We're going to handle it in the most highest level of confidence. And here's a list that I really wanted to go over with you. I know it's not a question to ask, but sometimes one of the biggest questions I, I sh- you know, hear from clients is, well, what doctor are you going to be using? And what, what kind of doctor is that? Guys, that is not a question you should be asking. And here's why. The Department of Wage and Hour says that you can accept, it is totally appropriate for you to accept medical documentation or a medical certification from the following list. So hold on to your chair because some of you aren't going to like this. Obviously, a medical doctor, a podiatrist, a um, OD, a dentist, clinical psychologist, an optometrist, a chiropractor, and limited to manual man- manipulation of the spine as demonstrated through x-rays. So that's, that's, again, giving us an idea of what possibly could be wrong, but not full diagnosis. How about a nurse practitioner? We can accept paperwork signed by a nurse midwife, a clinical social worker, and that obviously would be more for the mental health conditions, but not somebody we would expect to be considered at the level of a doctor or medical provider. How about a physician assistant? They even have on the list a Christian science practitioner or a similarly defined foreign health care provider or anyone else acceptable to the employer's group health plan or employer themselves. The list is not all-inclusive. This is just what was published at the time this or this material was uh, published itself. Individuals have a question. The Secretary of Labor determines who can provide health care services to include documentation and ver- uh, credibility and verification on FMLA paperwork. I know, guys. Some of those titles are not who you would traditionally put faith in in determining health conditions. But FMLA is not meant to judge. So, so. Please grasp that first. FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, is a a program to provide protections so individuals can get the services, they can get the treatments, they can get the care that they or their loved ones need without fear of losing their jobs. And with it being unpaid, that can be stress alone. That's why adding short-term disability or making sure that if it's a work-related injury and workers' comp needs to be involved, making sure those other programs are overlapping is even more vital. This is not one of my favorite topics because there are so many details, so many things that can slip between the cracks, so many things that you have to train your teams to be aware of because there are suits that I can I could give you tons of cases on where someone didn't address the Family Medical Leave Act correctly and an employee took it to court. If you liked this program, if you enjoyed this series, please let me know. There's so much more I can share with you, so much more I can provide for you. But your feedback is important. So I look forward to hearing from you. Remember, my name's Pandy, 
and you've been listening to The Human Resource. <laughs>